everybody. Hello. So I'm the other half of the team. Uh, Roland has been doing all of the hard work, and now I get to uh, share in the limelight for this one day. So uh, uh, I'm not just that much. That's right. In other ways. Uh, we've had earth amount material, of course, as you may remember, as I hope you remember, in kind of these three areas, the document management uh, technology that we started with early on, being able to file documents, find documents, and so forth. We then moved on to uh, in legal infrastructure, which is more or less involved with all of those aspects of use of technology and capturing um, data, legal data, and helping people find lawyers, using data about lawyers, and so forth. So not so much document-oriented as legal processes and, and use of information technology and, and facilitating those processes. And today we're going to talk about our third area of, of legal informatics, which is computational law. The plan today is I'm going to spend some time introducing the concept as I think of it. Uh, and I think that if we're, we're uh, moving to a more uh, common understanding of what exactly computational law is. And so I'm vaguely representative of that, that growing consensus. Um, and then after that, we'll have two other speakers, from Luna and Bart Behe, who will be speaking about aspects of computational law uh, as well. Uh, and at the very end, we'll have the first of our, of, of our uh, student presentations, uh, which all of you students are supposed to be thinking about because you're supposed to do. <laughs> all right, so, um, so we're gonna, I'm going to spend maybe 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes talking about computational law, and then we'll kind of break it down to a little time for uh, my preference is for interactive uh, you know, presentations, so please chime in as, as I'm going along and ask questions, and, and I'll try to uh, try to put it together. All right, so computational law. All right, let me get right to the to the nub of the problem. Uh, we live in this very highly complex <coughs> regulatory system, um, which has uh, is typified by numerous regulations that affect us. There's governmental regulations, business rules, contracts, and so forth. They determine and, and strict and constrain our behavior in a variety of ways. And they can come in many forms from many jurisdictions in the case of basic laws. Sometimes they're difficult to understand or to apply and to, uh, to figure out exactly what the constraint is on us. Sometimes there are gaps, sometimes there's overlap, sometimes they're inconsistent with each other. All of which makes it difficult for people to find rules and comply, and it makes it difficult for monitors and regulators and everybody in the, who's involved with this. In my, my view, that has led to, in many cases, a lack of compliance, either voluntary or involuntary, but involuntary, and certainly inefficiency in the system, and in some cases, a, 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 some sort of disenchantment with the legal systems. So they, feel they don't understand it, and it must be broken. So the question is, what can we do to fix this? Well, it's my belief that this is primarily an information problem. We're concerned with getting this information about the law and figuring out how to apply it to our lives. Uh, and as an information technologist, I think that we can use technology, or my hope is that we can use technology to solve this information problem. And so what, what I've been interested in since I began working with the law school is in the development of uh, in, uh, legal technology, information technology, designed to enhance the quality and efficiency of the legal system. And it should be, in my view, uh, technology that it affects everybody in the legal system, not just the, not just lawyers, not just the courts, but it should involve the citizens who are acting before they ever get to court, or they ever need a lawyer. And it could, could um, help these other uh, constituents as well. All right, so that's, that's my passion. Develop legal technology, make things better, use it. Well, OK, so what do you do? So one of the things you do is document that. You go back to all the work that has been done on textual representations of the law and all the technology that can be used to, to manage those documents for, on behalf of humans who will then read the documents and understand and interpret and apply those, the, the contents of those documents. And there's, of course, a wide variety of technologies that are well entrenched now. And we've been seeing, of course, a, a variety of cutting edge things that are now becoming uh, uh, use, more useful for, for the profession. The bad news is that this technology, good as it is, essential as it is, I think, uh, it's not possible uh, to provide adequate search to find the documents and then to apply the documents where it's hopefully want to make the application of, of that, that law in, in situations that uh, citizens find themselves in. So what we've been looking at is this 
alternative kind of extreme of uh, legal technology called computational law. And the phrasing, the rough definition we give to it these days is that branch of legal informatics concerned with the mechanization of legal reasoning. So not finding documents for humans to read, but making it possible for computers to understand, interpret the content of those documents, the content of statutes, and then to be able to apply them on behalf of the users <coughs> of those uh, of, of uh, the system to render certainly legal information and we'll have to say guardedly whether or not they can render legal advice because of uh, various issues on the best practice as well. But certainly legal information uh, should be possible. So that's computational law. Can we make the computer able to understand the, the content, understand the statutes, and apply those statutes? That's what I'm saying. Okay, so a good example of that that any of you have heard me talk or anybody else talking about computational law is TurboTax, one of the first. You enter some information about your uh, income and your, your deductions, and it computes for you your tax liability, and, uh, and in fact also then files your tax return with the IRS. That's uh, particularly been particularly useful. I my 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 experience with doing taxes was dramatically improved when I first used TurboTax, and I think other, millions of other people have found that same thing. It's computational law because the program actually has embedded within it the, the uh, tax code and applies that tax code to your situation to suggest what your tax liability is. Uh, and so it's not you have to read the tax code and figure out how to apply it, it actually does it for you. So good example of computational law. And there are many other areas where one could build TurboTax-like systems. Uh, building codes, electronic commerce, labor law, privacy, and so on and so forth. They are equally amenable to the technologies that are used in in, um, in, um, in TurboTax. And there are other areas which are maybe a little less amenable, but there are certain areas which I think are ready to be picked as far as this is concerned. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about what goes into computational law and what are the problems and then what are the opportunities for us. Uh, and that will be the uh, content of my remarks today. So first of all, uh, why, what, what does computational law consist of from an information technology point of view? Well, if we're going to get the computer to render, to do analysis and render conclusions based on that analysis, uh, then it has to have to start with some data that it actually understands. Generally, today, computers are not capable of understanding arbitrary natural language in, in, a, in, a, in an adequate way, but they are able to understand data that has been pre-digested into the form of, say, tables of data in a database. So information here about something about cities and flight reservations and so forth can often be represented in a nice structured form where the columns suggest the relationships of the entries within the columns. And so that makes it possible for the computer to do some computation if we can represent the data about the world in this form. There's a second part of the technology that is appropriate, which is how we render now the laws themselves to apply to that data. So there are a couple of possibilities. One is you can write software in programming languages like Java, and they can apply to this data, which is sort of what happens in TurboTax. But even better is if you can represent the rules and regulations in a form that the computer can apply, but also can do other things with, like explain its results to its users. And this is possible through a technology often called computational logic, where we're rendering the English language or the uh, version of statutes and rules, business rules, so forth, into a form that the computer can directly apply. For example, in this case, uh, coding the definition of what it means to be an office <coughs> is a business rule example. Or coding the rule, the constraint that it's illegal for somebody who manages somebody else to be an office maker with that person. So by writing it into this more structured, the, the statute itself, the business rule itself in this form, the computer can now apply the structured rule to structured data to derive and that's done because there's been a significant amount of work on practical automated reasoning technology, which takes rules and takes facts and generates conclusions from those facts entirely autonomously. Now, in the context of law, automated reasoning can be done, can be applied in a variety of ways. So first of all, the most, sort of most uh, elemental version might be detecting that an illegality exists. You have some data, you have some rules and regulations. Uh, John manages Ken, they both are in in room 22, therefore there's a violation because you can't have that up there according to those rules and regulations. And that kind of detect violation detection can be done automatically. 
It can also work in the other direction, interestingly enough. Same rules, but let's say you're trying to figure out who should go into what office. Well, one thing that it can do is to decide who should make office assignments or propose office assignments which will comply with the rules and regulations to avoid illegalities. This is what TurboTax effectively is doing. It's telling you what you should pay, not that you didn't pay enough. Furthermore, you can go a little bit further than this. You can actually generalize over all data sets, data sets and look at general purpose analysis of regulations. You could take a set of regulations and detect that an inconsistency can exist among those regulations. So those first say two, you can't, and if you can't share with a, uh, a subordinate, but then you might have another rule in the organization that says Skunk Works personnel have to live in the same big open space. Okay, well that's inconsistent with the idea that the manager can't share with, him, uh, with his, uh, his employees. So this is a bad, even before it has to be launched, you can be warn the regulator that this is not a good regulation. So this automated reasoner can what your research today can do all those kinds of computations using one representation of the rules and regulations. You don't have to hire different programmers to go do three different things. You just write the rules once, and depending on which button you push, the automated reasoner will give you different kinds of answers. Well, that's the promise. This is a really powerful technology, and, uh, and we'd like to be able to see how we can exploit it in the context of the law. What I didn't mention here, or I mentioned briefly, is it can also get explanations once you produce a result like this, it can violation detect it. Okay, why? Okay, well, it can actually point to the rules and regulations that were involved in deriving that conclusion. So people are informed about the law, maybe educated about the law as a as reason. Okay, so that's that. Now, there are problems, and I just want to mention some of these um, <coughs> problems. Uh, quickly, uh, that is, things are not perfect today. Uh, this is a common example. I'm guessing that two-thirds of you, maybe maybe 100% of you, have seen the case of all vehicles and no vehicles in the park. Okay, what does that mean? You know, what about bicycles? What about skateboards and roller skates and baby carriages of horses and, and you know, utility trucks and things of that sort? Are they covered or not? What does it mean to be a vehicle? What does, what, how, to what extent, to, to, to what vehicle does, kind of vehicle does this apply? And, and of course, also, what does it mean to be in a park? Don't have to fly. It's over. Is it in the park or not in the park? Uh, and so there's this question of how do we actually write the rules and regulations, whether they're done in uh, Java code or whether they're done in logic, we have to figure out what does it mean when we say vehicles. And there's a challenge there that those open texture concepts may be difficult to define, and it would therefore, and because we're never quite getting it right, that any kind of auto automated system would not have the right, if the right answer was human, might be more sensible. Uh, there are other problems of inconsistency. Federal law can sometimes disagree with state law, and Okay, federal truck trumps the state, but there are cases where, in fact, it seems to be going the other way, and the federal is not prosecuting where the state, in all cases, where the state is allowing, um, in this case, marijuana to be sold. And there's not necessarily, not everything is purely logical reasoning, like what I suggested earlier, but there may also be cases where the situation depends on some kind of an analogical reasoning to a previous case. And the tech automated reasoning technology that we have today doesn't really do analogical reasoning, it does purely deductive reasoning. And so we, it would not be appropriate or would not be applicable to cases where you really need to analogize one case to another rather than to use deduction from a general principle. These problems still need to be solved in order to be comprehensive. But to get computational law to be useful, we don't have to be comprehensive. And in fact, if you look in the business world, Today, it's the case that many companies are using systems very much like the automated reasoning systems I was just talking about to run their enterprises to, do, to, uh, to implement and deploy their business rules. Uh, so most companies will have products paid by SAP or Oracle or IBM to run their enterprises and to encode their business rules, despite the fact that those same problems of open texture and, and so forth exist in businesses as well as in governmental rules and regulations. So there's enough practical value that people pay a lot of money for this. What we'd like to do is to take that same technology and now move it to the governmental world to cover those cases where it can be done today and to cover more cases as the technology improves. All right, so that's the basic idea of computational law. Mechanize the, uh, encode the laws in a, in a formal way and then use that to mechanize uh, legal analysis. 
Now, so that's, that, I, I should stop here because that's really the basic idea and turn it over to my colleagues to, to, to talk about it, but I'm not going to do that because I <laughs> want to go, want to talk about one more thing, um, which is one of the ramifications, one of the possibilities of how this could deplo get deployed and why that's really, really important. Um, certainly it applies to all aspects of, of, of the legal system. There's many ways it can be used, but I want to talk about one particular one uh, first. And this is a, 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 an idea that I that goes by the title of copy the vaccine. I keep calling it the copy the vaccine. I'll explain why that's called the copy, the copy the vaccine. But basically, the concept is so-called embedded law. Uh, the reason that that uh, computational law is today so interesting it's been around. The concept's been around for decades. People have been working on this for some time. Some of the people in this room. <coughs> there you go. Yeah, as one of the one of the first people to really work extensively on this topic and, and to do some great work to launch the idea. But what's happened, there's something different from when Anne did her thesis and where we're standing today. And one of those big differences is the internet has come along and ubiquitous computers. So many things we do today are done online. We buy things, we book travel, we ship things, all done online. So there's records of all of this taking place, digital records of everything we do going into databases somewhere. And there's an internet with computers attached to it that can apply rules and regulations to all of that data. That doesn't, didn't exist back in the early days when not everybody had a laptop and not everybody did everything online. But it does happen now. We have this digitally mediated lives that we're living. And that makes the opportunity that we can embed law in everything we do in all of our computer systems and all of the other um, digital devices we, we uh, have available to us. Yes, sir. But this is a good thing. On that, now, now let, let's hold that question up. I did say I want to interact. I want to come back to it. So hold that question, and I will ask it again. I, but I want, to, I want to say what, I want to spill this, spin out the story a little bit, and then we'll talk about it. It's a really good question. So uh, I'm going to just give you three examples of how this might play out. So example number one is you're using your laptop or your architect is using your laptop to design uh, a house for you. Now, right now, the way that works is architects design houses, they print out the plans, they send them to the city, the city then reviews them, and three weeks later, the city sends back a list of all the things that were wrong with it, and then the cycle repeats, taking a long time. Why does this have to go through that cycle? Why is it not the case that the rules and regulations for the, the building codes for the particular municipality within which the building is being built are not part of the CAD system that the architect is using? So that as he tries to place his windows there, it can tell him immediately that's too small or those electrical sockets are too far apart. And can it, he can fix those immediately as he's designing his building rather than waiting for a three-week delay after which he has to revamp everything. So put it right there in the context in which the person's making decisions, rather than waiting for this after they after you act, then getting the response from from uh, from some kind of legal analysis. So that's one example of this. Uh, but there are not there are other examples. That's using your laptop. But also we are walking around more and more with cell phones. Many of us now with Google Glass that allow us to uh, have digital uh, capabilities as we as we're walking around the world. Why can't we also use those uh, devices to bring the law to uh, inform us as we, as we act in the world? So when I go to walk in the woods and I see that plant, yes, I know I can today just snap a picture with my, with my uh, cell phone, and it will tell me that it's an orchid of some sort. But furthermore, why can't I then find out whether I'm allowed to pick it or not? And if I happen to be in Massachusetts, I'm not allowed to, but if I'm in Maine, it's okay. So what is, why can't I do this as well as that? There's no reason not technically. We should be able to bring these rules and regulations to the point of decision of somebody who's acting in the world. And it doesn't have to be just your cell phones or your Google Glass, but it can be your car, uh, hence the cop in the back seat. Wouldn't it be nice to have a cop in the back seat who's your friend telling you when, what the laws are and what not to do in order to run afoul of those laws? Why does my why not have my speedometer show me not just how fast I'm going, but how fast I'm allowed to go? So that if I can't find the speed limit sign, it's right there on the speedometer. And if I don't know whether I can turn left or right, it tells me. If I don't know whether I can park here at this hour, it tells me. The car should be telling me all this as, at the same time. We're embedding law 
in our devices and in our, in our cars and our computers and, and um, in our cell phones and Google Glass and so forth. Let's, if we can computationalize the world law, why not deploy it in the AU with its computing as well? So that's the idea of embedded law. Oh, by the way, that idea is not new. Uh, I happen to fly planes, and this has been around for some time in cockpits. Pilots are told you're not allowed to fly within these circles at certain altitudes. It's, it's displayed right on your, on, your, on your dashboard. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be in car cars that we all drive as well. OK, so uh, uh, let's see. I'll skip over this in order to get on. Uh, just more applications. Uh, there are fun get applications too, like games. And if you want to train people, why not deploy, uh, look at games which allow you to deploy rules and regulations like SIPSIF. Um, you can set up the rules and see how the society behaves. You can actually try out things and look, run simulations as well. Okay, um, so uh, I just don't want to run over time, so I just want to get to uh, a couple of philosophical issues and then we can have your, your, your question. Your question. So, I like to think that this is really important, this ability to, for us to use information technology to uh, provide automated legal analysis. Uh, and uh, it's, in some sense, for me, a qualitative change in the way the legal system works. There was a time when there were no written laws at all, and then along comes Hammurabi, and they, the laws are encoded, literally cast in stone. And now everybody knows what to expect. And the, function of the law of informing you what you're allowed to expect is, is achieved. Next step might be, let's try to propagate those through uh, publications, the printing press. Now we don't just have to go look at the stones, but we can actually, get, everybody can own their own copy of the law. That's good if you could actually have all of those thousands of pages available to you, then at least in principle, you would, you would know what you can expect. But the third step is, what if we now could take it further and you don't even have to read the law? If the computer can, can uh, tell you in, in situ what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do via your various different devices. I think that's a qualitative step forward in terms of, of how the legal system works. And that's kind of what has been interesting to me and why I got started in Codex in the first place. But there's also some legal arguments about why you have to be able to, uh, to, to make sure that law is is accessible to everybody, or otherwise it's not really valid. Okay, um, yes, go ahead. Uh, given that everyone will have a different fact situation when trying to use these legal automated reasoning systems. Uh, yep, sorry, uh, everybody have what? Uh, different fact situations. And yeah, yeah. I was wondering if machine learning has been combined with these logic-based. Uh, I in think order that's to, an like, interesting prospect. I don't know that machine learning adds anything here. Okay. So, uh, but, but it may very well. I mean, machine learning is an extremely powerful uh, technology, and and, enorm and, and its, it's, it's, its influence is growing significantly in the world. In this particular case, I'm not quite sure what the purpose is. I see machine learning is a case where you've got to look at a lot of cases and then yeah. from that abstract some generality. That's what machine learning is mostly concerned with. Okay, now, so. if we've already got rules and regulations that have been authored by humans, well, let's let them. Let's just write them down. We can bypass the whole machine learning. The case where machine learning might work is when you look at, for example, cases in court which have been decided, and then you might want to abstract a general principle from a wide variety of thousands of cases to sort of suggest some analysis. And that's a case where machine learning, I think, would be useful. But why why go through a, a potentially buggy machine learning process when you can actually write down what the statutes are? If you could do that, that's better. If you can't, then you fall back on machine learning. So I think there's a place for machine learning, but I wouldn't say that you should be thinking of machine learning as the solution to the whole problem. I see. Yeah, I was thinking of like combining the two. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Com bringing the two together is, is a great idea. Yeah. Now, we want to take on your problem? Yeah, um, so <laughs> my question is, is it good or bad because you, most of the examples you gave were noticing people about what the law is, right? If I'm looking at the, at the flower, I will be told that I'm not allowed to pick it up when I'm in one place, but I'm allowed, I won't be noticed about it if I'm in another. But that can also be extended to perfect enforcement and yes. actually pre prevent me from, from, you know, pick, from uh, doing something that is not allowed, like in copyrights or in, uh, if I want to make sure that so, so Someone wouldn't be able to say something. So let me tease that apart into a few pieces. So first of all, you said you said a word which I disagree with, and strongly. Not that you're wrong, but that I would like I'm on your side on this. Which you said it would prevent you. 
from doing something. And, and I think most of the people I know who work in this area are not necessarily thinking along the lines of a system that will prevent you from doing anything. So we wouldn't want to have our car not allow you to go faster than 55 miles an hour. We'd like it to warn you. Maybe there'd be a nice little voice telling you to go and look fast. <laughs> but, you know, but it doesn't stop you from going. So the so-called regimented versus unregimented system. We prefer unregimented systems that let you know. It's purely extra information for you. So in that sense, I'm completely in agreement with you. This should not be restricted in that way. But it does raise other possibilities. And just let me mention these. And you can, society, you, others can decide for themselves whether it's good or bad. I think it's good to have the choice. Now, how you make that choice is something we all need to decide as a, as a society. One of the possibilities is that same information gets sent back to the DMV. And now when you're uh, going 62 miles an hour, it just goes on my bill. And the DMV sends me a bill at the end of the month, and I pay it for all the times I've exceeded the speed limit. And you know, it just becomes a regular economy like everything else. Who knows, maybe the DMV makes money on this. Um, so there is that possibility. You may not like the idea that it's Big Brother watching. It's like the tunnel. There is uh, yeah. some tunnel of some tunnel where in the state that if you go too fast along yes, the tunnel, yes, actually, this already exists in some places. Yeah. There's some of the automation red, red light uh, cameras are similar. Mm -hmm. So there is the possibility of, of using it in ways that, that we might find unobjectionable. Uh, there are also good things. Insurance companies might use that same information to lower your rates. If you never see the speed limit for a period of time, maybe they'll lower your insurance rates. So it might be a good thing as well as a bad thing. And I think that's something we get to decide, but what we technologists should be doing is offering society options and letting the society make those decisions. That's my position. I mean, other people don't have to agree with this particular thing. Uh, one, more, one more possibility is when you have technology that's based on individual data and so forth, you can also have differential laws. We could have laws that don't have, you don't have to have a fixed speed limit for everybody. It could depend on road conditions, the car you're driving, how old you are, so, you know, um, 20 something in a sports car might be able, might be safer than an 80 year old in a, in a driving a, um, a, a minibus. And um, I don't know maybe the other way around, but, uh, <laughs> but there is that possibility that you could have differential enforcement based on, on extra factors of that sort. The law could change as a result of this very technology. Uh, with, the, with the mind towards figuring out what the next step is, in your opinion, what's the single biggest obstacle to the adoption or implementation of embedded law? Ah, okay, so there's two halves to that. One is technical and one is, 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 is legal, sure. and I'm the technical guy. So I think the technical issues are the ones I listed. There's still these issues with analogical reasoning, particularly open texture. Uh, the legal problems are, I'm going to leave to this <laughs> uh, Let's see, I'm, I, okay, the final two, because we need to move on, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you think, so might there need to be substantive changes? Because it seems you're mentioning how you could get a more particular factual analysis, but it seems to me if the laws were written with an idea of that they not they aren't embedded, it seems to me you at some level expect a big substantive change once they are embedded. Um, so in so some, I, at least in some I wouldn't be surprised at, and I'd be actually pleased at is my is my personal reaction to that. Right, but if we had no changes in the law, already the technology would be used. Right, that's my position. But I think you raise a really interesting question, which is, do regulators do a better job of writing rules and regulations? And are there these substantive changes, like the thing I was just mentioning, where you might have differential speed limits? I think that could happen. And again, we're presenting society with options and alternatives that may lead to societal value. Okay, can I, do you have one? Yeah, actually, quick note is, uh, from a technical standpoint, the reason, the challenge what we have is not able to decide whether it's zero or one, yeah. whether it's a true or a false, <coughs> anything, right? So that's the major challenge in adoption of law uh, to the aspect what you just emphasized. Uh, I think that is a critique that many people have, have, have that the comment many people have made. I actually, I believe more in the zero one thing. I think there's a large subset where it's valuable for the for the person to have a zero one judgment mm. uh, or opinion of the of the, the system as he makes his choices as how he's going to proceed. But there are also cases where you might have some which verticals of law when we can really or not. So I was suggesting some of those is more bright line criteria like the tax code and there's the building codes and things of that sort. Really where there are areas which I think are right. administrative law, I think is, is right for this. But you know, Phil may have more to say about this. Okay, so let's let me move on and and I'll allow our next speaker to to take up the, the story. Phil Malone, one of our own here. Uh, 
DOJ originally for how many years? 20, a little over 20, with working with antitrust, as I, as I understand, right? And then he decided to slum for a while, went to Harvard, <laughs> and I'm um, and uh, I was a professor, and then also running the uh, Center for IP and Innovation Clinic, right at Berkman. Uh, and finally has moved out here and is now with us and is interested in access to justice, and there is a re close relationship between that and digital well, thank you all, and I'm glad to be here. I hope that I can tease out the close relationship that I think exists. Um, I'll just say some of what I talked about, I'm going to try to build on and sort of jump off from what you heard last week from Bonnie and Kathleen, um, and not repeat it. There may be a little bit of, of similar stuff. I want to elaborate a little bit on some of what they said, but I hope that I can take the, the kind of technological tools they were talking about for access to justice and use those to move us into thinking about how those kind of concepts might work in a broader, more kind of computational law approach to access issues. So uh, let's see how that goes. My background in all of this, I ran a clinic at Harvard for 10 years before coming out here. And one of the things we worked on for the last four or five years was helping the Massachusetts courts figure out how to think about technology as one of the tools they use to facilitate access to justice and access to the court. So that's what got me into it, and I think the readings included a report that we did for the court three or four years ago. So pretty early piece of thinking about some of the, the fairly basic ways, right, some of the basic tools that we could use to, to deal with the justice gap a little bit, or at least to, to start trying to deal with that. Um, so I want to want to build on what you heard about last time and, and hopefully bridge to some of the, the more computational uh, parts today. How many of you were at Future Law, Future Law 2 conference last week? Okay, so it'll be a tiny bit of repetition uh, from that as well, but, but uh, I'll try not to do very much of that. One of the things I'm sure you heard Bonnie talk about last week was just the huge need that exists within uh, sort of the civil legal system within the U.S. There's this massive justice gap where you know lots and lots of people who have legal problems don't have any help. They come to court, they're not represented, Often the other side is well represented. So, you know, the statistics, Bonnie has some. Chief Judge Lippman from the New York State Courts was here yesterday or day before talking about similar work he's been doing in New York. Situations as bad or worse there. Four out of five people who go to legal aid offices um, trying to get help with their legal problems are turned away. And these aren't just minor problems. You know, we, we think about you know, we have the Gideon decision and we have right to counsel in criminal cases. Uh, and yet a lot of the civil cases have impacts that are, you know, in a lot of ways just as important. You can lose your kids, you can have your family completely disrupted, you can lose your house, you can lose all your money, you can have all sorts of penalties imposed on you. Zero right to counsel for any of that. And so, so many people, huge numbers of people, huge percentages of people end up navigating that part of the legal system by themselves. So. Uh, something that, you know, as you heard from Bonnie last week, she's been dealing with for 15 years now, is thinking about among the many different interventions and policy tools we can use to try to solve that problem, what role can technology play? How can we use some technological tools, some automation and so on to try to make that better? So I want to talk a little about some specific technologies, build on some of what she talked about last time but then also kind of jump to some higher level, big picture questions about all of this and whether it's appropriate to even be using technology in this space, what we think about issues like transparency uh, and the sort of need for human involvement and so on. And that, that covers, a lot of that applies to sort of computational law in general. The more we make this an automated process, what do we need to be worried about from a sort of both, you know, legal standpoint, ideological standpoint, human standpoint. So finish off with, with some of that uh, stuff. I, those of you who are in future law might have heard, if you could hear well enough, uh, Richard Susskind in his opening talk about sort of differences between automation and innovation. Did anybody catch that? So he basically was talking about technology and dividing it into two camps. Automation, as, as I understood what he was saying, is basically taking things we do now and just using technology to make it better or faster. So I think a lot of you know, tax attacks maybe is kind of in the middle, right? We've always filled out forms. We've always sort of tried, you know, sat there and scribbled calculations to see how much we owed. So it's not a completely different thing. But the notion of 
a program that would ask you a bunch of questions and then do that and then spit out the forms which you could then immediately file. That's pretty transformative. So maybe in between. But a lot of what we're talking about is just using technology to do better. So answering questions, giving people tours of the courthouse, giving them access to legal information. And that's, that's just automating what we've always done. Billable PDF forms online, you know, just using a computer to do what we've always done. Um, but a lot of the sort of computational law approaches uh, that Mike talked about are much more sort of innovation in the sense that this is a whole new way of coming at something. This is dealing with a familiar problem, but in a very different way than we've, than we've had it before. So I want to talk about a, a couple of, of those things. So I want to, want to steal a few of Ron's slides uh, from the panel that I was on with him because I think they're, they're so good. The good news is there's a lot happening in this space right now. And this is a remarkable time for kind of all the forces coming together to use technology to help solve the justice gap. So the Legal Services Corporation has had a program for the last 14 years now to give money, give grants to local groups. They've done all sorts of stuff around uniform state websites, uh, an increasing number and system for interactive forms, the A to J author system that I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, so really a huge amount happening. Uh, in this space. Um, and there have been a bunch of things recently. So I was part of the Legal Services Corporation that had a technology summit. They had one way back in 2000, which started a lot of this. And they had not had one since. And you know, a few things have changed in the technology world in the last 14 years. So a couple of years ago, they had another series of meetings to try to sort out how legal aid and legal services should use technology. And they came up with a bunch of things. And a lot of other people are sort of doing it so let me spend a minute on the automated form uh, creation. I think Bonnie talked about this last week, but I don't know how much she walked you through it. Um, but you're basically taking a process that for most self-represented people is incredibly challenging, right? So you want a divorce. You can go down to the courthouse, maybe talk to somebody, and they'll give you a pile of forms, and you've got to figure out what the hell do I do with these. You know, and, and for people with limited uh, reading ability, language issues, and so on, sitting down just with those forms and trying to make sense of it, you're at a huge disadvantage, right? You're starting at a huge, huge uh, position behind and trying to deal with the system. So um, what the automated form system was to try to do what TurboTax is done. I mean, it's very much a TurboTax visual guided interview approach. Uh, so, you know, it gives you very nice starting points. Uh, and then it takes you into a nice graphical, A to J author is the one that she used most often. Did Bonnie walk you through examples of this? Did she show you what they look like? No. Okay, so I'll do it really quickly. It's not, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But, you know, it's this wonderful sort of graphical representation. And it's basically a pathway to the courthouse. So you can't really see it here, but way in the background is the courthouse. So, you know, you're starting here. Here's the person who's going to help you. And it asks you a bunch of questions. They're really simple, straightforward questions, and you fill them out. And as you fill them out, you kind of move further along. And they tend to be very, if they're done well, dynamic and interactive. So at each step of the way, you have the chance. There are often little bubbles that say, click here for more information. And you get a text box. Sometimes you get a video that explains something. You know, a question may say, have you been receiving uh, public assistance benefits? you're not sure what that means or you know, whether you're getting them or somebody else's, you can click on something and it'll give you a nice, simple, plain language explanation of what it is. So just like TurboTax asks you a bunch of questions and then at the end spits out a nice completed form. Uh, and the system they created is great. It doesn't require you know seriously tech people to create it. Um, it's got a very user-friendly front end that allows people to sort of break down the process into the decision tree all the different steps that are needed. And then uh, plug that in, and then that creates the questions and the sort of logic path that the people who are filling out the form follow. Um, uh, and you know, as I said, all sorts of things can pop up to sort of you know, ask questions, give you information, fill in things. It can be video, it can be audio for people with uh, either limited reading or visual disabilities or uh, whatever. So, Used primarily most states now, a lot of the um, legal services groups have a bunch of the state forms automated. California, the courts, Bonnie and her staff have actually automated a lot of the forms. Uh, now, I forget, like 700,000 uh, uses per year or 1.7 million. Some really huge number for lots and lots of forms. Um, one of the things that's 
really interesting in thinking about pushing out from just using these to complete forms. And we shouldn't underestimate that, right? The ability just to get your story right in the form is huge. And if you talk to judges, you know, dealing with pro se litigants is one of the most frustrating things they do, sometimes because they're just arrogant and they don't like dealing with regular people. But often it's because these are people who don't know what's going on. Right? So they come in, they don't have the forms they need, they don't have the answers they need, they don't have the documents they need, they don't have the witnesses they need. If they have filled out the forms, they're maybe done wrong and stuff's in the wrong place, or you can't read what they say. Systems like this take care of all of that. Right? They do it, they lead you through the process in such a way that they do a pretty good job of getting the right information in there. They're printed forms, so they're legible, so there's no problem. So it enhances the efficiency of the court process greatly and actually puts the user, the, the sort of litigant, in a much better position. Um, so that's just the document assembly part. But people have started to think about this technology as a way of bridging a bunch of other things that don't work so well in the system for uh, uh, for um, unrepresented people. So sometimes you can use the same process if you just need information about you know, what's the process for getting a divorce in California. How do I change my child support uh, order? How do I get these kind of benefits or change these sort of benefits? Instead of going to a website that just shows you a bunch of information or maybe plays you a video, uh, you can actually use this kind of process to walk through and get a bunch of questions of, you know, what are you interested in, what do you want to know, what you're, and you'll get an answer that's actually tailored to you instead of just a bunch of texts. Um, benefits, calculators, eligibility, and so on, perfect for that, right? You enter some basic information in an accessible way and they can then tell you, yes, you're probably eligible for these benefits. You might be eligible for three to $400 a week in this or that. Um, uh, a couple that I want to talk about a little later are uh, online intake. So for people who do manage to get help from legal aid groups and, and court self-help centers and so on, you know, it can still be a slow, cumbersome process. Often they have to go in in person, you know, sit there, work through a form with someone before anybody can even decide, well, are you eligible or not? And so legal aid groups are increasingly increasingly using automated systems like this to make that process a lot smoother. You answer a bunch of questions, it answers things, and at the end, it presents that to the intake person and say, okay, great, I now see that you're a you know, single mother of three, you're unemployed, your benefits are $16,000 a year, you have this issue, you have that issue. I can now start the conversation here instead of having to start it down here and walk all the way through. Um, E-filing, I'm going to talk about in just a second. And then triage is one of the most interesting ones. Uh, and I'll save that because when I move more into the full-blown sort of computational law expert system, of approaches, triage is one example that I want to use because uh, it's one place that people are thinking about actually making this interface between the, the two happen a little bit more. Um, E-filing is fascinating and I just, uh, I always talk about this because it drives me so crazy and I suspect it will seem bizarre and I need to you two given your backgrounds. So in a lot of states we now have these pretty well established document assembly programs, right? self-represented people get online, maybe they go in California to a court self-help center. They sit down, they enter all this information. Uh, they now have a complete you know, digital version of what they need. It's in this nice XML format. It then gets moved over to a hot docs program that, that creates and populates a form, you know, the specific form the state needs. What happens then? So the person that created it then presses print, then comes out on a piece of paper, then they have to get to the courthouse, which may be all the way across the city. They may have to take off work. They may have to get child care for the kids. You know, they get over there, most courts now have electronic case management systems, maybe e-filing systems. What do you think happens at that end? So this poor person that spent all this time creating this document, right, they walk in, they hand the paper to the clerk, and what's the clerk do? So they scan in the document, and then they probably have to type in all the sort of caption and envelope information. How ridiculous is that, right? It's such a crazy waste. Instead, why don't we have a system that after you complete the document, then the next little half on the guided interview says, would you like to file your document with the court? And if the answer is yes, then you answer some questions to get into the e-filing system. You press a button and shh, it sort of gets transported over in a way that it pops right into the e-filing system. It's compatible with case management. It populates everything and it's there. 
you would think, so we've been doing this, this is not new, right? The A to J author stuff, I think we've been at for 10 years now. Again, you know, hundreds and hundreds of entities using them, most states have it. How many courts or systems do you think have solved the direct e-filing uh, problem? The sort of, you know, automated form to direct e-filing? Take a guess. How many courts do you think you can do that now? Two. As far as I know, one. one. And maybe a couple now. The Orange County Small Claims Court. So the <laughs> simplest, most basic thing you can get, they figured it out. They have a model where you can do this. There's a pilot project in Minnesota to do it in state courts, which last I heard was sort of falling apart and not working. Florida tried it. A lot of the e-filing vendors or commercial companies that do e-filing work on it, claim to have capability. And for some reason, this is not rocket science. For some reason, they just haven't been able to make it work. I don't think it's technological. So there's a whole set of open standards. There's something called ECF-4 that deals with you know, e-filing standards and the format information at the end. And there's this group called OASIS that sets standards. And the output of the AJ out there is nicely standardized. But there are all these sort of business process issues in the courts, mostly about the, all the formats in which they need things to come in. And also, our courts are a mess, right? They're horribly fragmented. So it's not like you have, you know, the federal courts, where you've got pretty much one system. You know, the federal courts have an e-filing system. It's clunky as hell, but it works. Um, but the federal courts don't have any pro se filers, so it's not an issue. But you, know, you take California. I don't know how many different court systems California has. But you have different county courts. You have different courts for different kinds of things. Florida is a complete disaster. There are like 50-something different courts, some based on counties, some based on whether it's housing or family law. Most of them have different e-filing systems. So it's a huge mess. Any of you who solved that problem will have done the world a massive service and, and probably made a hell of a lot of money in the process too. Because it's just sort of absurd that we can't, you know, that a fairly easy technical problem hasn't been fixed yet because there are enough other sort of competing business problems to go along with it. So, yeah. one question. Is there any regulation issues? There's a lot of individual state regulations, so particular courts decide, you know, what does our e-filing look like. You know what most courts have done to solve the, you know, difficult for self-represented people to e-file? You know what most courts have done to do that? They've sort of included in their rules about e-filing that uh, pro se litigants may not use the e-filing system. <laughs> Great, good solution, right? The people who benefit the most yeah. in some ways are, you know, by design excluded. Or maybe they're not deliberately excluded, but in order to use the e-filing system, you have to have a bar number. It's a problem. Or in some cases, you know, you just have to have a credit card in order to pay the filing fees. That excludes a big chunk of low-income self-represented people right there. So part of it is regulatory, and part of it's just design. It's just these are not, and we see this all the time, these are not the people the courts are thinking about when they design these systems. And, and there's, you know, not the biggest percentage of filers, but they're the biggest percentage of people who drag down the system with inefficiency. Yeah. So we, we asked, I think, a similar question last week, but in the places where it fails, I mean, why does it fail specifically other than just like business problems? Is right. it judges just don't care because they print out the emails they get still? Or, <laughs> and does tech gap? Or is it yeah, just I, institutions in the court are weak and don't have the money? I wish I knew the answer. Part of the problem is nobody has done a lot of use for years now. Nobody has done a kind of comprehensive study of the five or six biggest failures to say, all right, exactly what went wrong. Is it a technical issue? Could they just not get the compatibility or the middleware translation right? Or was it business processes? I was involved in an effort in Massachusetts to do a little bit of this on a very small scale that went very roughly. And my sense there was just that tech people in the court weren't talking to the tech people in the legal services group. And when they did, they were speaking past each other. Um, but somebody should do that. I mean, it's, that's how you make it go right the next time. And part of the problem is, you know, there are so many fragmented, one-off approaches, and there's really not a lot of learning from each one to try to get it right the next time. And that's, that's a function of the fragmented courts. It's a function of limited resources. You know, it's a function of everybody just being focused on what they're doing. Yeah. And who buys the case management systems? Is it the court itself, or is it the federated IT department? Or? Typically the courts. Yeah, most states, the courts have their own IT departments. Is that not the problem? Under. Yeah, it's part of the problem, right? They tend to be less fit. There is a, a national organization of court uh, uh, CIOs that's getting more and more sophisticated. And a lot of states have a single statewide court CIO. Um, 
and they're trying to figure a lot of this stuff out too. But then at the end of the day, they take orders from judges and others who, you know, they can solve some of the technical issues, but they can't solve all the other issues. Yes? Do you think some of it could be vested interests? Like they're worried, you know, if there's all these great technical solutions outside the court, then inside the court they're not as necessary? You know, I don't think it's that. I think, you know, there's a huge, you know, part of what's happened is you have this dramatically increasing number of self-represented people and sort of need for help at the very same time that budget cuts have led courts to lay off hundreds and hundreds of courts. So it's the perfect storm for inefficiency. So you think the courts would be desperate for anything to make it better. One piece of that that I think is true, though, you know, some people say hey, that some judges worry that if you make it too easy for pro se filers, there'll be more of them. That somehow you'll encourage people to come into the court system. You know, my reaction is, have you looked around? I mean, you've got so many now that, that it's not like you can make it that much worse. If you could make the ones who are here now a lot more efficient, wouldn't that be one? I've never personally heard that from judges, but enough people repeat it that I suspect there's some of that going on. But I think most people get it that this could actually make life a lot better if we just nailed it. But there's not. It's a complex sort of bureaucratic failure of the right people with the right resources being interested. Yeah. So I was thinking about centralization issues. Centralization clearly makes things more efficient, mm -hmm. but it goes against the American spirit. Yeah. Right. I mean, you never, you know, we have federalism, which means every state does this on its own. And within most states, the courts are, you know, themselves, you know, a whole bunch of different fragmented things. So, uh, you know, again, the federal system is a good example because we have, you know, a single system and we have a single administrative office of the courts that does this. Um, we've got an e-filing and electronic PACER system that, even though it looks embarrassingly kludgy and you know, it would be a million times better if Google or someone else ran it, it, it works. It's pretty good. But the feds don't face any of these self-represented issues that the states do. So. Uh, you know, it's not fair to give them too much credit because they haven't really had to deal with all of this. Um, so let me just jump ahead because I want to talk about one or two of the high level uh, things that I think are, are so interesting. And um, uh, so out of this Legal Services Corporation Technology Summit came a report that listed, uh, so, so one of the things the head of LSC said, we think that if we use technology, we can provide some form of assistance to everyone some form to everyone, and those are really important qualifiers. But right now, we're providing nothing to, you know, 80% of everyone, so that's a pretty good goal. Uh, the, the sort of summit identifies five specific things. I just want to focus on the last one, which is developing expert systems, uh, but really for a different purpose. The focus here is on really more knowledge management and so on, which is fine, but not, I don't think, the thing that's most interesting. Um, out of the, also out of the technology summit came, and I realized too late that I should have had you read this instead of the, the report, this very long article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology uh, that was written by a bunch of participants at the technology summit that covers a whole bunch of these issues all over. So if you're, if you're interested or want to follow up, this is a great piece to look at. Uh, it's uh, using technology to enhance access to justice. Least clever title ever, but it'll get you there. It was in the fall 2012 uh, edition. I think if we have it actually, it's one of the Oh, it's the one Okay, good. Yeah, it's totally worth hearing this. You know, good stuff and bad stuff in there. So one of the challenges that, that people talked about and, and that came out that kind of bridges the gap with what Mike was talking about is what if we could develop sort of computational approaches, you know, expert systems, if you will, to deal with a bunch of things. But let's just take one first, triage. Triage for uh, low-income legal assistance. So the way the system right now works, you've got you know, legal aid offices, you have law school clinics that serve underrepresented people, you have court self-help centers, and people constantly, you know, all day long, call, they come in, and it's an incredibly inefficient process, right? So, you know, they describe their system, their problem, they go through, it takes a very long time, uh, and at the end of that process, at least 80% of them are told, gee, I'm really sorry, you have a big problem, we can't help you. So it takes a huge amount of time. Uh, so what if you could uh, design an automated computational system that would sort of be the first point of entry for everyone, and then it would begin to use a lot of the sort of technology Mike was describing to begin to filter, right? And at the very end, what you would hope it would do is sort of put people into buckets. So there are going to be some people that somewhere along the way, maybe early on, the system will recognize these people have A, a really serious need, 
and B, nothing else is going to help them. They need a lawyer. These are sort of the most deserving and the most likely to benefit. So part of the calculus now for triage, you know, it's, a, it's, it's art, not science, right? People who have been doing this for 30 years and legal aid offices, you know, have a pretty good sense of, you know, just how deserving is this person? What's their legal issue? What's their family situation? What's their income? What are their other legal problems? You know, are they undocumented? I mean, there are a million factors that go into it. it but then also, you know, is this a case we could win for them? Or is this something where we're sympathetic but they're screwed? Um, and so some people, are going to need help from a real lawyer and should get it within a very limited resources. So you want to be able to figure out who those people are. And then once you hit capacity, you've got everybody else. You've got the 80 or 90 percent of everybody else. What if you could separate those? What if you could say, all right, this group of people would actually be able to, on their own, you know, maybe here in our offices, maybe in the court self-help center, maybe at home on their own computer or at a library computer, you know, get through this system fill out, you know, do the guided interview, fill out the forms, and go into court. This other group of people, probably not that, but they're pretty good, right? They can do a lot. So maybe if we could direct them to what Bonnie probably described as a staffed self-help center, where somebody's there with them, they do a lot of the work of filling out the form, you know, online themselves, but there's somebody there to help. Um, you know, what if somebody else gets, you know, a legal navigator to a system a little bit, but doesn't actually get a lawyer? You know, what if you have a system that actually helped to sort that out? And you talk about the sort of you know automated reasoning that Mike was describing. Lots and lots of very tricky decisions and, and logic jumps that have to be made there and, and sort of art, because it depends on all these things we talked about. But a system like that could look at a lot of the same factors that human legal aid people do now, plus you know, it could assess, maybe, assess things like how proficient does this person seem to be in English as a language. If not, let's switch them over to Spanish or whatever the other, uh, their other primary languages. How proficient are they there? Uh, how technologically proficient are they? You know, you could imagine a system that could assess that remotely, could assess that just by their interaction with the system. How long is their response time? What happens when we give them this prompt or that? And then just, you know, sort of how on the ball is this person? Is this somebody who kind of gets it, gets the system, and is able to respond? So it's an example of one of the hugely challenging but really important potential uses for these kind of systems in access to justice to help do in a vastly more efficient way what we do very inefficiently now. I'll spend one more minute on two of the high-level things, and then I'll wrap up. Um, with all of these things, the, the kinds of embedded systems and computational systems Mike was talking about, any sort of automated triage or automated benefits calculation, there are two really important human elements that we can't lose track of. One is transparency. Right? You know, I don't think that the system, I don't think users would tolerate a system like that if it were a black box. If you just sort of said, okay, I'm going to enter some information, then I'll get a number. You're entitled to $217 a week. And that's it. You don't know why. You don't know what led to that. You can't challenge it. If it gives you a bad resort, a result and you have a lawyer, the lawyer can't challenge it because nobody knows what goes on. You can't appeal it. So this notion of transparency in however a system would work so that you could sort of verify from the outside, yeah, it's actually using the right logic rules. It's calculating benefits in the right way. It's sort of you know distinguished you from you in terms of who gets legal help based on these sort of objective factors. I think that's hugely important to this sort of acceptance. You know, there's the question of what do you think the biggest uh, uh, sort of barriers to adoption of this sort of technology are. Part of it is just that, right? This human sense that I want to know that it's right. I want to know that it's fair. I want to know that it's not somehow rigged in some way. Um, and the other piece of that is what the, the this article that you know, I was talking about calls dehumanization, sort of notion that. I think is going to take time for people to deal with that you know, we're used to the legal system solving our problems in you know, human ways and, and there's this bizarre completely misguided sense that the system works pretty well and it leads to the right result in a lot of cases but you know people kind of believe that and if you're going to replace that or replace parts of it with technology there's got to be some sense that we can trust it the same way there have been studies that show that for a lot of people who go into court, uh, especially for issues other than, you know, my kids are going to get taken away, I'm going to lose my house. It's actually as important or more important to them that they feel like 
I was heard. I had my day in court, the judge heard me. Maybe I lost, but I really had a chance to tell my story. And if we have a system that maybe, maybe more often gets to the right result, but doesn't give this people a sense that you know a human being, a judge, someone heard them out and really gave them a fair shake, then I think adoption is going to be really tough. And I think solving some of those you know much bigger you know psychological, emotional, societal questions is going to be a key to to actually moving toward greater adoption of these kind of computational things. Okay, gone over. I'll stop. Take a couple of questions. Is that similar to medicine? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Nobody wants to be completely treated by a robot, right? And it's great to have all this stuff help, but at the end of the day, you yeah. want a very friendly doctor yeah. there who will sit on your bedside yeah. and tell you, it's, yeah, okay, I think that's right. The problem is, so many people don't get that now. Yeah. You know, they just maybe they get a judge, but they have no help yet. Yeah. So I want to take an unpopular position on the humanization thing. Um, I, I fully, am, fully appreciate that, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's something needed to grapple with. Mm -hmm. One small counter argument to that is that when people understand rules and regulations and it's clear that they're outside of the rules and regulations, it may mean that they don't need to have their case heard mm -hmm. in court. It's right. only when it's sort of arbitrary. Like, you made that decision, but you didn't hear my side. Right, right. Or right. I didn't really know. Or, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. But when, if we can fix that problem, we, then maybe the demonization argument will be the Yes, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. How much do you think then a solution would be just like add in other options for say my issue is more complex on this? Because I'm thinking like in polling, oftentimes people will be frustrated when there's like a limited number of answers and like those don't reflect how I feel. Yeah. And there's no button to be just like more complex, I want to give a different answer, fill out my own form. In your experiences there, do you have any experience with that? Do you think that would be a helpful solution? So people talk a lot about that problem and often the solution is that it's sort of an exit ramp. So if you're in the system and you're just frustrated, you just don't want to deal with it, there's a way to say, no, no take me out to a real human. Right. That's great if there's a real human available to do it. The, the assumption behind so much of this is there just isn't. Right? We just don't have anybody to do it. But there may be ways to build that into a system that you know, we just say, look, th this doesn't fit me, give me more. You know, part of the problem you're trying to you know, some of this is pretty objective, and you got a list of six factors. Some of it is more, you know, the what's a vehicle kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there's only so much you can do, and you could have somebody type in a bunch of stuff, but it'd be hard for the system to then figure out how do I put this into the overall calculation or sorting or whatever. But psychologically, I think that's probably right. Okay, so uh, yeah. let's, let's okay. Kind of hope, in the interest of finishing our yep. time, let's hope that Phil will stick around and answer yep. questions uh, individually. Can we? Meet at 3:12. Start again at 3:12. And uh, sorry, no, 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 no. I wasn't I was really just Oh, no, no. But I can see in some context, especially if it's What are you doing in Canada? We're always famous. You can get process in the post. Simple or the simple. It's not really useful. Which country is it? Yeah, I think it's the technology. 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 Around that problem. Financial 
is. I, I mean, I think we have a long way to go. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Say what's on the yeah. 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 So, what should I put on the search? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's done. Oh, no, but it's still. Oh, long time. Along with human judgment first, and then the same thing. Okay. So, you guys are going to go over the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Like, I have to do it. Yeah, 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 I have to do it. So which country is a little more complicated? Which country? Whatever it is. Tech technology country, country, or the best is one of the top three countries. I don't know. So it's pretty They're all the same maps. Yeah. 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 Yeah
that leads to the entry so we're going to have a very relevant so that's one there's some this is one of the things I was talking about when I was mentioning about the end of the list but you've got to get something like a wall the whole point is that sometimes it goes on the chat it's like no they get so pissed off so you probably hide it yeah no it's right you don't have to give up on the whole thing whereas if you had you had to take pride in the Biden that it was made of certain on your money it's not like you actually know something that they don't know that would be my yeah. Yeah. Right. That's all right. That's, uh, that's, that's the easy part, right? So ah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next act, Professor Martha Hay from University of Groningen, and here this year with us as the resident fellow, uh, Codex fellow, and we're, we're pleased to have him. Uh, Bart has made a lot of his reputation on uh, the theory of argumentation and particularly its application in, in the law and, and, and the public sets of record with respect to AI law. I think that's what we're going to be talking about. So I consider myself to be a representative of the academic field of artificial intelligence and law. And indeed, I focused on argumentation for a long time. I started as a mathematician and then I ended up by accident in the field of law. I wanted AI. The law was an excellent, but I'm still happy for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the law and AI are very different, so this is the legal situation in the court. There are these people, and they have conflict, and the judges are trying to solve that conflict in, in the law. And then there is artificial intelligence. And I, on purpose, use this picture. This is the eyeball <laughs> robot. Mm -hmm. It's the little bit crazy idea that we can build machines that are smart, maybe as smart as we are, ourselves are. And then you have AI and law, which combines the real world problems that uh, occur in courts and the little crazy idea of artificial intelligence. And where else than here at Stanford in Silicon Valley would you want to do AI and law? Well, uh, AI has a strong history here. John McCarthy, uh, the, I don't know in what relation exactly might you stand to John McCarthy. John McCarthy was the one who coined the name artificial intelligence 50 years or something ago. And, uh, and we have a great law school here at Codex Center. But then there is also a small issue with AI. Because, well, here is an old <laughs> cartoon. You see the kind of computer that is in the place of the judge to suggest how old this cartoon is. My Ada Lachman, I have been to talk of my age flash. But your honor, you sometimes have a dream too, don't you? And this is the issue in the sense of artificial intelligence, and then here, especially in the situation of the law. Computers don't understand us in our world. That's the problem. And in fact, that's also something that we are working on in a sense, but then from a legal perspective. And believe me, we are not close to building machines that understand us and our world, but that's a challenge in a sense. So the field, and that's something that I learned here also, has been around for a while, and I knew that. But not everybody knows that, that the field is already around for a while. So the ICAL conferences, International Conference on Artificial Intelligence Law, the 2013 edition was in, uh, in Rome. I was the proud program chair there. It has been around since 1987, if I'm correct, 25 years. There is a jury series of conferences that started more or less in the same period, and that started in the Netherlands by a historical accident. So, by this historical accident, the Netherlands is a strong community, also in AI and law. Here you see a book review of Anne Gardner's book dating from 1987 and probably even written a couple of years earlier. A review by Edwina Risland. It's also nice to see that two of the people that started the field are female. <laughs> and she wrote about an artificial intelligence process for legal reasoning. And she was a lawyer and or she is a lawyer and a computer scientist. So she combines the two kinds of uh, expertise that you needed. And what is interesting she did not pick as a topic one of those <coughs> areas that we now think of as being especially suitable for computational law and AI law. What she did was she demonstrated a working model in the domain of contract offer and acceptance. One of the hard areas, right? Or at least we think of those areas as hard. So one thing that I like to emphasize is that we here typically think of 
legal tech, computational law, AI law, as being possibly a tool to disrupt the law as it is now performed. But, and uh, if you look at the future law conference that was here two weeks or something ago, you also see that that's where the emphasis is. The law will change because tech, we will help them, let's say. Do you see Margaret Hagen's nice summary in design? And if you look at what she has also on, on, as, uh, used as, as slogans, they are all about changing the way the law functions in society. The problem is the bar can in intervene without even the pub public com complaining. There's clear unmet need, also phenomenal, just now mentioned, etc., etc. But I emphasize something different in a sense, or at least something complementary. I believe that the law can also disrupt tech because we are not there yet. So you mentioned this is not rocket science. And we in AI and law are also really thinking about how to change technology to be suitable for the law. Technology has to change. That's something else. And of course there is an interaction between the two sides. So while changing the law, we will change technology, but it's working both ways. Don't forget that. So you can contribute to, uh, to both sides. Legal tech already exists. It has been said in different ways, but I will also say it in a slightly different way. And the idea started with this perspective on, of machines and legal reasoning. Deciding legal cases consist of applying law, the law consists of rules, machines can apply rules, therefore machines can decide legal rules. And this is the perspective that coincides more or less with the subsumption model, as one scarce proposing. The law, the judge has a bush de la loi. The law is there. You just have to say it. You just express the law. That's what you do as a judge, right? Well, and indeed, this perspective, simple perspective on what the law and the decision making is, does work in a certain sense because we have expert systems of some kind. So here you see what's called the Boote base in the Netherlands, which is a small country. Therefore, it's more easy to have the kinds of legal transparency. We also like our governments maybe a little bit more than here in the US. <laughs> well, of course, we also have our issues, but it is, it is different. The, 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 the governments really work hard in presenting the information uh, uh, to the public. We want more, of course, but here you see, uh, for instance, the, the public prosecution presenting the, uh, the fine system of the Netherlands to the public. And here is a nice one for Americans, I think. Drugs up until five grams of marijuana and that kind, you will not be prosecuted, and you only have to give your drugs away. That's what you, that's the only thing that happens. And then, of course, you want to know if you have your heroin around you, up to half a gram of heroin or cocaine. Well, you just get a fine, three hundred and forty dollars a euro. Certainly, it's five hundred dollars of money. And if you want to know more about if you have more than a half a gram there, you can check the boote base. Also, there is this example of, I will skip it. Well, I was, so the, no, um, there is no time for that. But the other one is the, 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 the TurboTax of the Netherlands. TurboTax in the Netherlands has been designed by the Dutch IRS. So we have our own government institution that does Computational law, AI law. And what you see over the years, it works very nicely, but you see over the years, they really have made things simpler for us as in the public, but also for the government. Because there has been an interaction between the tool that, has to, that we have to use and the way the law is. Because well, you, you, you make different choices. There are certain things that you simply cannot handle with these tools. So, well, then let's skip it, let's make it simple. So there is a slogan, leuker kunnen we het niet maken, wel makkelijker. We cannot make it nicer, you will have to pay your taxes anyway. But we can make it easier. <laughs> so legal tax certainly exists, but then the question is, is it already disruptive? Well, I don't know what you think of that. I think that we still have to make sure that it does. And if we want that, there is of course the question of what you want. But there are some hurdles, and I like to use the hurdles that have been already around for a long time. So here I quoted Edwina Rislin's version of what Anne Gardner said in her dissertation. 
so it was not entirely clear whether it was Edwina paraphrasing Anne or whether this was Ed Edwina, and I could not check her book here, Anne, I'm sorry. But here is the list of hurdles in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, 1988. Legal reasoning is rule guided rather than rule governed, which is something else than the subsumption of a model that would scare the past. Legal terms are open textured. Michael already mentioned that. Legal questions can have more than one answer, but a reasonable and timely answer must be given. The judge will have to decide. The answers to legal questions can change over time. We have different opinions, society changes, etc., etc. Serious hurdles for technology also. So here is an alternative model of what legal reasoning is. That's what is called the theory construction model. And one of the other American founding fathers, parents of the field of angle, Thorn McCarthy, is associated with that. This is a picture that I use in my work. And the idea is you have the evidence for the facts for the legal consequences in a kind of initial version. You start with some, something, it's a kind of hypothesis or, about the evidence, the facts, and the, the consequences. And then you are going to do a lot of work, argumentation, I like to call it. And then at the end, you have a final version of the evidence, the facts that follow from the evidence, and the legal consequences. But that is a process. So this procedural perspective is something that is very typical for the law, and it distinguishes it, I would say, from the subsumption model that we saw before. And then, of course, for AI and law, the assumption is, the working hypothesis is, well, it can be automated. We don't know how, but it can be automated. That's the whole idea of AI. We are just machines, and we don't understand how we work, something like that. So the research agenda is also clear. Well, let's find out how. And then it's going to take a while, we take this for granted. So I'd like to mention also a historical connection. This is Stephen Toulmin, a British philosopher who went to the United States and uh, is associated with, with discussing the nature of logic and then especially from the perspective of argumentation. And he has hit this list of, of perspectives on logic as theories of reasoning. So first, logic and psychology described an individual thinker's thinking, then logic and sociology describe patterns among people that people share general habits and practices. Logic as technology, and he's not referring to something like computer science, interestingly, mm -hmm. but thinking of it as an art, let's say. It's reasoning is an art, so you have recipes for rationality, something like that. Logic as mathematics, find truth about logical relations, and it's the foremost thing that we most typically think of as, as logic. And then, and this is so interesting for my field, logic as jurisprudence. So let's look at the law, and this is what he actually defends in his famous book, The Uses of Argument, of dated from 1956. Let's see how it goes in the law and adapt our logical models to fit that. Emphasize the cases that we make for our claims. It is very context-oriented. There are different standards, etc., etc. And in a sense, the field of AI and law, or at least a part of the field of AI and law, is developing that program. And another nice uh, historical connection is John Henry Wigmore, an evidence thinker, uh, uh, they, uh, an American uh, evidence scholar who already in 1913, sorry, way before Stephen Toulmin, wrote a book, The Principles of Judicial Proof, and it has also a strong argumentative feeling. And what is nice about his work, especially from my current perspective, he uses diagrams that are still around in a sense in our software that we build. So let's continue to three examples of argumentations in AI and law. The first one, rules with exceptions, is one of the technical hurdle, hurdles that needs to be solved. And there is interesting and good work concerning rules with exceptions. So Mary's bike is stolen, and John buys the bike from the thief. Who owns the bike? Every legal system has to find some kind of answer to this situation. Because both and Mary and John have a reasonable cl claim to the bike. Ownership is not broken by theft, typically, you would expect. But also, buying gives ownership. So there is, a, there is something there, and I must admit that I don't know how it has been raised in, in the United States, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Because it depends on the circumstances. That's what I already know. In the Netherlands, I know several different things that matter. For instance, 
uh, if you buy a bike in a shop and it is, and it is, it is a stolen bike, yeah, well, then you are the owner because of your inner yeah. analysis it is. But if you buy a stolen bike on the streets for a ridiculous price, let's say $25, and then unfortunately you are not the owner. Things like that. So the law provides rules to co resolve conflicting principles in a generic way instead of case by case. And here you see the, the, the initial situation. There is a conflict of arguments. And then, for instance, one thing that is relevant was John in good faith, was he bona fide? That's relevant in some way also in the, in the, in the US system. And maybe it depends on states, I don't know. But uh, here you see, if he was bona fide, well then, maybe that's uh, an exclusionary reason against uh, Mary being the owner. Maybe. At least this is how you could model it. And John was not bona fide, could be an exclusionary reason for the other argument. And in some way, the legal system will have to answer these kinds of conflict resolutions. And that kind of reasoning can be modeled nicely these days in technology, in, in, in software. So for instance, here, here I show, this is an advertisement for my own work. I have built some software in, in 2005, it was published in a book, where you can really do these kinds of arguments. You can, you can enter your arguments in the tool, like kind of uh, a theory construction tool, you can build the arguments. And you see also which conclusions are supported, justified, and which aren't on the basis of the logic. Of course, the th system only governs the logical rules, let's say. It does not know anything about the facts. You have to do that yourself as a, as a user of the system. And this goes back to many people. One person that I like to mention is Don Pollock. He was not in the law, but he was interested in, in the modeling of the physical reasoning and the argument. And, uh, in 1970, wrote a very influential paper called The Free Reason. Let's go to the second example precedence and analogy, very uh, important also as a technological hurdle for AI, not because it's so typical for the law, and also so important and also so hard, we, we do not really understand perhaps. But from my perspective, some of the most interesting thinking about analogy stems from the field of AI and law. And uh, the idea is something like this. Legal conclusions are drawn on the basis of previously decided cases. If someone decided, if some decided case is relevant and similar to the pres present case, the current case, then under the doctrine of what's called stare decisis, the same conclusion should hold in the present case. So here's an example. Can a certain dismissal be voided? And there is a precedent case in which there was one reason for dismissal. Avoidance of dismissal, the employee's results were always good. Where, and there was one reason against avoidance, there was a serious act of violence. And in that case, the outcome of the case was, well, the dismissal should be avoided. But now there is the current case, and it is similar, relatively similar. There are several factors that are the same, but there is also a difference. If the, the two factors here are there, but there is also an additional uh, uh, reason for uh, avoidance, namely the work atmosphere, was not affected. So what is the outcome then? Well, on the basis of analogy, you would expect that it's only stronger in this case. And you can then have an argument that by analogy the current case should also be designed for avoidance. And this is at the heart of uh, Kevin Ashley's famous hypo system that he developed under the guidance of Edwina Rispin, as I mentioned, and he was here months ago or something like that, talking about his current work and he's now working on natural language processing and education is reasoning technically. Factors are generalized facts pleading for or against the issue. Cases are treated as sets of factors and for present in case the outcome is now. And I must admit that I'm skipping over many interesting details, but this is the heart of it. And for instance, one thing that is good to mention is, of course, there's not always an answer when uh, on the basis of an analogy. For instance, now if there is an additional reason against violence, the employee has a history of violence at work, something like that. Well, then there is a relevant distinction and you don't have a basis for, for making the argument on the basis of the precedent. That's something to work on. And in fact, this is very important in Kevin's work because he's also thinking about hypothetical cases. Just let's, let's vary the case and maybe we find an answer by looking at the hypothetical case. You don't have the precedent then, but you at least have, can think of the consequences of the hypothetical situation. It's, let's say, a tool to develop the law. 
And then evidence and probability, something that I'm now working on a lot. And if you were there in my class one week ago, sorry. Oh, I'm just wondering, for the case-based reasoning, when you have some sort of new situation where there's like two pluses or two minus, so this, do you start to maybe incorporate things as weighting the factors based on like strength of precedence? So, so for instance, in, in, uh, in uh, Kevin's model, Kevin Ashley's model, there is the idea of dimensions, and they are kind of weights. But I must admit that in the literature, this is considered one of the hard things to model. But, you know, there is work to do that, but certainly it's, it's taken into account. And in a sense, the idea of incorporating probabilities in your models is, is also on that path, because <coughs> probabilities are a way of, of being between the zero and the one. We already in the, in the first talk by Mike, there was this discussion of zeros and ones. Logic has zero and one, true, false. And in, in between, there are all kinds of values that can be strengths or weights or probabilities. And currently, I'm working a lot on that. And la last week, I had a talk on that uh, in the college lecture series, and it will be online soon something. so if you want to know more about that then you know, I recommend to, to check that out and uh, the start of that is the, 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 the Lucia de Burg case in the Netherlands a nurse who has been in prison for some six seven years for mur several murders but now nobody even believes that there were murders there were now the deaths that she was convicted of originally are now considered to be natural and it, it took a long time to establish that. And, uh, it started with statistical reasoning. Here is Lucia. She uh, uh, was around too many strange suspect situations, let's say. That was the basis. And then there was an expert, and he said, well, he modeled the situation. He used the data, and he checked out how often nurses and also Lucia were around difficult situations where babies died, etc. And he computed a number. The probability is 1 in 342 million that a nurse's shifts coincide with so many unexplained deaths and resuscitations. Well, that can't be too well then. That cannot be by chance. Well, of course it can be by chance. <laughs> and moreover, be careful with using mathematics, because that's what happens here. If you tell this number, then strange things happen. I, know, I'm, I started as a mathematician, so I know the power of mathematics. It can be very helpful. So there are these very interesting texts on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And of course, it's unreasonably effective. We fly to the moon because of our understanding of mathematics and things like that. We build atomic bombs, we build computers. Unreasonably effective. But we also make unbelievable mistakes on the basis of mathematics. And these are no nos. And at least you have to think about it a lot. And this is an issue that has been around for a long time. Because my current belief is that at the heart of what was going on in the Lucia de case is that the people that were the statistical experts, let's say, could not really communicate with people that were non statistical experts. The lay people, in this case, the judge, the judges. So there is a real communication gap between uh, statistical experts and uh, non-statistical people that do the decision making. And, we, and there is a good reason for that. We don't really have a shared language. And there is a, a lack of understanding what the other side is really doing or something. If you, if you look in the de into the debate, it's, it's very interesting. These days, the statisticians are on the strong side, let's say, because DNA evidence is clearly statistical in nature and it is well founded scientifically. But that's all for good reasons. And lawyers are on the wrong side, judges are on the wrong side because they do make, make mistakes, like everybody, like also, interestingly, the statisticians themselves. That's interesting. Don't forget that also the statisticians make bad mistakes with, which are formal in nature. And we need to do something about it. So design a practical shared normative framework is the goal of also a project that I'm running now at a distance because I'm very happy to be here at Stanford with my PhD students are working in the Netherlands on this project. There are in the literature three normative frameworks, argumentation, well, we already discussed it in the scenarios, scenario thinking where the two sides of a, of a, of a course, uh, situation defend the, the story of what has happened. And so the, the prosecution tells how the crime was committed, whereas the, the defense tells why the, the, the suspect is innocent, let's say. 
and there is the probability uh, calculus with its own normativity. <coughs> but I will not go into the details at all because of uh, time and also because of this other lecture that I gave last week. There is, I believe, a rather simple connection between these three perspectives. And for some reason or other, this is not popular because for all kinds of scientific reasons, historical reasons also in, in research, the idea of having a probability as a measure of argument strength is not believable. And that's, I now am, have started proposing that again. It's an old idea, but for all kinds of reasons, people have stopped believing it, or they are false. The simple perspective is often good, or at least that's what I'm not defending. You have evidence, you have stories that are supported by the evidence in some way, and you can try at least to measure the strength of the argument by a number. Normally you don't have the number, but that's another matter. But at least normatively you would have a number, and those numbers behave like probabilities. There may not be more uh, uh, probabilities, which is another matter, and these are really important for the, for the philosophical debate, let's say, but they behave like probabilities. Argument strength behaves like uh, probabilities. I'm going to have a lot of fun in, in, in my academic life in, in discussing this argument with this. So this gives three examples of argumentation in AI law. Rules with exceptions, we have good models for that now. Precedents and analogy, we at least have good ideas of how to connect formalism and analogy, but we are clearly not there yet. I think that here the big innovation is all going to be. Then there is evidence and probabilities, and I am working on mixing this all together, and I expect that to be good technological process. Because this is, these are good examples of how the law is disrupting tech. We have to do new uh, algorithms, new formal tools, new mathematics on the basis of the needs of the law. There is work on the winkel. Nous avons du pain sur la planche. I wanted to translate this uh, Dutch phrase to English, and I didn't really find a nice one. I don't know what you have. We've got some work to do. Well, it's boring, right? As werk aan de winkel. In our shop, there is a lot of work. Something like that. Nous avons du pain sur la planche. We have a lot of bread on our plate, on our board, something like that. We've got some work to do. I don't know. If you have a good expression, tell me. So here, there is again this software that I, that I presented. But it's really old-fashioned already from my perspective. And uh, we need to work there. In a sense, even more uh, old-fashioned is this work by Charles Brenner. He is presenting the D his DNA evidence tool. And it's a fantastic tool. I'm, I'm very jealous of what he has, because what he builds is relevant. His tool computes things that we want to compute because we, for instance, want to identify uh, who a certain, uh, who this dead body is. Who is that? He has the tools for that, but in very old-fashioned form. He built it himself. It is uh, it's still a text-based uh, interface. So what I want to do next is integrate what he has done and his expertise in a tool that is, let's say, a rationality support tool. Because that's something that I uh, keep emphasizing. Here you see a still from, uh, from the Homeland series, where uh, Carrie uh, is talking to her, her uh, supervisor. I forget his name. Right? I don't know. You're the one to know. <laughs> <laughs> but you are the one to know. <laughs> but what is important here, she has had a Saul. breakdown. Saul. 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 Yes. Saul. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So she has had a mental breakdown, and, but she was still smart. And she has marked all these papers in colors, but it was a big mess. So at a certain moment, there is all this paperwork on the floor. But Saul manages to make sense of what she did. So that's what is happening here on the wall. And that's what I propose to do, make sense making software that can help what has been going on here between Carrie and Saul, but then the software thing. So if you are interested, and just some advertisement before I hand the floor to the student, 
So on May 30, there is a nice uh, event, trial with and without mathematics, or at least we hope it will be nice. I'm organizing it, so I cannot say it. <laughs> I, I work hard, Marcelo and Bello, to make it nice. And we are, they're going to speak about philosophical legal and computational perspectives on the role of mathematics in the law. Is it good, is it bad, etc. Uh, that's in two weeks, in a couple of weeks and a year, so this is next year, 2015. There is the next edition of the AI Law Conference. It is in San Diego, close by. Very nice uh, 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 series of conferences if you are interested in these matters. And then there is this paper that was written about <coughs> the history of AI Law, in which 50 papers that have been influential or that were nice uh, selected by the people that have written this are discussed in two pages. <coughs> so if you want to get an old, a feeling for the field, then this can be a nice start. Thank you for your attention. Mm. One question, maybe? Go ahead. Yeah, I, when I read the papers that you submitted, I kept thinking about, well, it, it sounds that the law is presented here as uh, something that's only top down. Right. You have rules, you can say what they are very clear, but when you compare it, for example, for the common law, common law is based on other rules that were developed along the years, and they are not written by, by the, always by the, by the uh, legislator, but rather evolve through the years, and you need, you need maybe a strong computer to tell you what they are by analyzing all the data. So if, if the papers gave that impression? No, it's no, I, I, I thought I If the papers get an impression, then the papers are wrong. Because this is key. What you say, the, why is argumentation important? Because it facilitates this progressive development, construction of the law. Not only in communication cases, but also as a system, let's say. Yeah, so that's very right. And I personally do not believe that, for instance, the perspective of rule based reasoning and case based reasoning is really different, essentially, formally, something like that. I believe that they are just different ways of expressing the same processes. But in the literature, there is a big mess on that. And this also has to do with historical things, such as, for instance, in Europe, they are typically, uh, the thinking is typically rule-based, or so people say, and in the United States it's typically case-based, or so people say, but of course rules are important here too, and cases are important in, in Europe too. So let's work on, on a good model for that. That's also something that's happening in the field. It's not really clean yet. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so we've got a, uh, something new this week. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of uh, multiple, I hope, presentations from students on um, what they've been doing this year. Today we have Elizabeth and Andrew uh, talking about their project. Let me just remind you all who are taking the course for credit that we are hoping and expecting you to present as well. And if you haven't already signed up for a slot for the next however many weeks we have left. Uh, then please do so, so that we can schedule you with the tours. Is that for people doing papers as well? That's a good question. Uh, we should I, I think we would like you to, but be nice, I, right? if that's, yeah. then it's not required. Well, actually, the paper is your main deliverable, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you don't have to. Okay. If you want to. <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> Over to you guys. All right. Um, so we worked in data-driven compensation in the law, basically looking at um, what's going on with the billable hour and what are alternatives to replace that as a means of making promotion, performance review, and compensation decisions for attorneys and law firms. Um, so just to give you a little background, we'll talk about people analytics, which is the application of big data to um, HR decisions effectively. Then we'll do a comparison with a relatively similar field in terms of firm structure, consulting firms. Then we'll talk about how you apply it to um, we'll talk about how you apply it to law firms. And finally, um, if there's time, we'll talk a little bit about something else we like. Um, so people analytics is an attempt to use data to um, either get something to make an HR decision or um, get some relative data to back up an HR decision that may be intuitionally based. Um, ideally, you have direct observation 
Um, because even management professors say, say nothing in the science of prediction and selection beats observing actual performance in an equivalent role. No matter how much data you get, if you're actually there observing someone's performance in their role, you're going to have a better understanding than um, what data can tell you, at least at this point. That's what they think. But the problem is that we run into a lot of different biases when we make decisions, all kinds of decisions, from hiring decisions, performance decisions, compensation decisions. Um, some of these are snap judgments. We take a small amount of data and think that that's really meaningful um, and extrapolate way beyond what it means. Um, there's a lot of work in labor economics which says for every inch of height, you're going to earn an extra couple thousand dollars a year, even though they can't find any justification for that. Um, then there's uh, labor economics where they look and psychology where they look at the appearance of CEOs and they find that they look competent, that increases their pay. Then they look at the company's performance and they can't find anything statistically different um, from what they do. Um, and then there's powerful, compelling evidence, for example, that we gender. Um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about how when you start doing blind performance um, auditions in professional orchestras, all of a sudden women go from being substitute performers to being uh, first chair. <laughs> so there's a dramatic difference there. Um, and then I think what's most compelling is um, that there's personality and leisure interests. Um, some business professors have looked at um, have looked at investment bank hiring decisions, elite law firms, and elite consulting firms, and found that essentially the commonality through all the hiring decisions is that the interviewer shared a leisure interest with the interviewee. That was the strongest predictive factor. Um, and so the basic idea is that there's all these problems and biases in our decision making. And they don't mean that at core, our intuitional judgments are worthless, but they rather suggest that we should have some data to back up our um, intuitional judgments to make sure that we're not just having underlying bias. And moreover, but when we run to that data, we shouldn't allow the data or a, an objective factor to control those intuitional judgments. So a few of the idea would be that if you rate someone, if, well, are they on time to every single meeting? Well, you could have someone who's late to every single meeting and still a star performer. It's not really necessarily a great, a, a great measure. So the question is, what are those key measures that you can get objectively to help back you up? I was just going to say that, like, at first for our project, we were thinking of, like, well, let's make, like, instead of just kind of compensating people in terms of bonuses on the billable hour, um, let's try to make it more complex and have, like, other data points that we're looking at, um, you know, such as things like, are you, you know, on time to work? Like, did you, were you serving, did you serve on a team that the motion was successful? Or did the case really settle in your client's favor? Stuff like that. And it was after talking with one of the um, partners, um, uh, which we were um, put in contact with, that we kind of realized that these things were just as subject to like all of these kind of biases and um, kind of snap judgment points as you know the whole billable hour was. So that made us realize that you know you can't just you know rely on these kind of like you can't in your quest to be objective, you can't just say okay I'm going to do things that are easily quantified just because of that. Doesn't And then another big problem with using poor um, objective measurements, such as like a billable hour, is, um, is that it tends to not only may it not pick the right people who are performing in the right way, but it might also might demotivate every single person you're um, working with. So some of the words we hear are like soul-crushing billable hours. And the reason is that they tend to focus on a carrot and stick model and emerging models in psychology say that the best way to motivate people is let them really engage with something. And if they're counting hours, they're not engaging in emotion and thinking about legal arguments as much. They're trying to, to um, they're trying more to focus on am I meeting particular metrics. So if they start gaming the system, they don't like their work and they're not doing as well. And that's a particular challenge. Um, so one of the things though is that people analytics is that big data offer new, new ways to look at who is successful and why they're successful. And so there are a couple of what we thought are pretty innovative firms. Um, the first is Nikit, um, and it uses neuroscience-based um, games, basically. It tells you to play a game, and then from that they try to assess personal qualities. So for example, there's one where you look at the faces of, um, you look at faces, and how quickly can you tell if this face is anxious or angry or stressed or scared, 
and with how much accuracy can you do that, and that can assess your emotional intelligence. Um, another example is Evolve, and there they apply a lot of data for um, call center employees, and they found that some surprisingly, um, things, some surprising ideas that you wouldn't think of are really important. So they found that you want people who are technologically savvy enough to be on social networks, but if they're on five or six different social networks, that social network might be more of a distraction in the workplace than not. Um, and so um, what they did for Xerox in their call centers is found a lot of data that's strongly correlative with an employee who's going to be successful and who's going to stay for a long time. For example, because call centers don't pay very much, the commute distance is an important factor. If they can find a similarly paying job with a smaller commute, they'll switch jobs. Um, the, the, a lot of this is pretty um, powerful and decisive, but some risks are that you get into data that might be dangerous. For example, um, browser data, for example, if you're using Chrome, Mozilla, Internet Explorer, can indicate your level of technological savvy, but it also might be a privacy violation. Um, same thing with your email, what type of email are you using? Um, your marital status and your commute length, again, those, are, those have impacts on your performance, especially in these types of jobs, but um, there might be some aspects of confidentiality or discrimination because if people cluster in certain areas, you might be looking at certain groups. Um, two more, um, particularly what we thought were innovative. Um, there's an MIT professor who uses badges and he found by just putting a badge on and walking around with it all day um, and listening to metadata about your speech, so how much you're talking, who you're talking to, because your colleagues are wearing them as well, um, they can predict about 50% of team performance. And basically what they found, the big uh, differentiator there was formal communication outside of a structured and formal meeting. So are you meeting with your colleagues outside of something that your boss sets up to interact and collaborate on the project? Um, and then there's last one called the guilt. And basically what they do is they data mine on the internet to try and find out who good coders are. So if you're typing a lot of information into Stack Overflow and it's really helpful and it gets upvoted a lot, that's helpful information. They also found that there's some things that are more surprising. For example, um, coders tend to like certain types of, of anime and so certain types of anime are correlated. That, that's one of the issues that um, we uh, thought up. Um, so then going to consulting comparison, one of the things that I think is helpful to understand um, one of the problems in law firms is to look at consulting firms. And if you look at them, they're largely similarly structured as a firm, even though there's different outputs. So they have a partnership model. They transition from making to selling. Once you're a partner, your job is to sell and then just quality control the work that your analysts or associates are doing. Um, they, partners tend to heavily specialize, and then if there's a problem that they can't solve on their own, you just pull more partners onto it. Um, and then again, here the big problem is that quality is not easily observable or quantifiable. There are some differences between consulting firms and law firms, um, but the, uh, we think to the extent that there are differences, they suggest that consulting firms would be more effective at assessing performance. They tend to be more quickly, quickly embrace technological change, and they have much more extensive experience with HR. A lot of consulting firms have human capital projects that they work in, so they're advising other companies on it, and they advise law firms on it sometimes as well. Um, and so the big difference, there's, I think there's two big differences. The first is that um, some consulting firms actually track, well, they call it utilization, but it's their effective version of the billable hour. Um, but none of them actually bill on that. They just want to see how many hours someone's working to see if they're working. And compensation is not tied to it. So you're never going to get a bonus if you work, let's say, 2,200 hours versus 1,900 hours at a consulting firm. They'll track it to make sure, well, are we staffing our employees? Do we need to hire more employees? But it tends to be less, less of an important measure. Um, what we take from all this is it suggests that the consulting firms have made the decision that no data um, is better than using bad data like um, a billable hour on its own, and that they trust um, a consensus decision more than they trust bad data and how they do their reviewing decisions. Um, all right, so based on all this, kind of looking at the corollary um, uh, industries and also talking to some partners in the legal industry and kind of trolling um, legal discussion websites um, above the law, of course. Um, we decided that a billable hour was really a terrible way to measure um, uh, performance 
and we understand that the billable hour is not like the basis for most compensation. Um, usually, you know, you're in the lockstep with your class year, and that's your salary when you're an associate. When you're a partner, you're going to have a percentage of equity sharing. But above and beyond that, the way you differentiate yourself, especially as associate, is by the hours you bill, and that's really the largest determinant for your bonuses. They aren't merit based. Um, so we. Based on that, we realized the billable hour is a very important metric, and that's kind of the only way that associates often compare themselves. So we realized we really need some um, more nuanced ways to measure it. And we were hoping basically to create a system that would not just replace billable hours in terms of bonuses, but also replace you know, the entire format of compensation for associates, so that, and possibly even partners too, so that you're not compensating anyone in lockstep or based on billable hours. It's all based on merit or what we found to be easier to quantify predictors of merit. Um, so one of the discussions we had with um, an attorney we spoke with was that um, the trend for the billable hour came towards client pressure, which was very interesting to us that clients actually wanted this. But based on after the uh, recession and subsequent downturn to the legal industry, we've been finding that a lot of um, firms are going towards flat fee billing just because um, clients are able to pay for exactly what they get rather than how many hours people spend on this. And we thought that given this, there's going to be a natural shift in firms away from the billable hours. Since if you're confident, if you're having clients compensate the firm based on um, flat fees, you're going to need to find another metric other than billable hours to compensate employees. Um, so at first we looked at, um, and I realize it's four o'clock, so if anyone asks later on, it's um, I At first we decided to look at other um, different um, kind of data points in order to like, you know, figure out whether or not there was like another metric that we could use to um, kind of use as a way to compensate people for the purposes of bonuses or for their entire compensation structures. And we realized that this wasn't really going to be as easy as it looked. Um, because this easily objectified data, like did you, how many members are on your teams? Are you the first person to um, be chosen for a work assignment? How many um, projects did you work on have successful motions? What percentage of the um, you know, uh, did you write? How many pieces did you look at? This is also subject to a lot of biases, and the reason that people get on those good projects might be some of those same biased um, reasons that we saw in the first slide. So, um, one of the attorneys we spoke with really emphasized that attitudinal skills are really a lot more important than actual, um, just kind of like than your output. And like this, for example, like really wanting to win and being willing to like stay late and you know really feeling like case is your own, you have agency over it. Um, she said that that was kind of more important than a lot of the kind of like easily quantified skills that we think of. So um, based on that, we um, have been looking at like people analytics and we realized that even though there's not a lot of causation between um, a lot of these things that we could look at in data, there is a lot of correlation. So um, based on that, we would want to apply people analytics to the way you compensate attorneys, um, associates, and partners for their entire compensation. Um, so basically, this would, you would what you would do is you would kind of look um, look to the people that made partner and do, do like a study of a couple legal classes and basically get a lot of data about these people. So what kind of, when they go on Westlaw, for example, and they have an assignment to you know do a legal memo on this question, are they going to a treatise or a case first? And those kind of like data points that like you know we can collect through um, people's internet research or through people's practices or how many emails did the person exchange with the partner who was assigning it? Like how long did the person wait after getting the work assignment to make that first initial contact? How often is this person looking for follow-up questions? All this data points could really we don't really have any hypotheses about like what would be like in predictive of the most successful attorney, but it could be interesting to look at this data. So basically this would involve taking like multiple years of collecting this data and then seeing which of those attorneys went on to become partners based on our um, premise that intuitive kind of evaluation is always the most, you know, is still a really good way to go. So basically we look at, for all these people that we have all the data on, what factors were in can we find that were in common for the ones that like made partner. And then based on this, we can apply it forward thinking and see about compensating people or looking at people's advancement or evaluating people based on these factors that they exhibit on, at an earlier stage. So these are some of the um, people in a lot of companies that you know, we could look to, but none of them would apply exactly, so we need to work on kind of um, honing it to the legal system. But um, basically, um, 
you know, potential criticisms are that, you know, a lot of this is correlative, not causation, you know, which is a problem, but at the same time, if it's a good predictor of people's success, then it might be more unbiased and kind of like nuanced way of um, evaluating people. Um, um, well, so I guess one thing, um, sorry, one criticism is, so, is that you're relying on intuitional judgments um, to make decisions, of, and one worry is that if you start to use data, you might be reinforcing them. But what they found, um, especially with guilt, is that once you build up a strong enough data set, you start to actually influence the way those decisions are made, and you start to build, um, you start to, over time, adjust the correlation as well. So it's not easily gained because, uh, for example, in guilt, they use over a thousand different variables. So, um, and they're constantly changing the coefficients on them um, as data scientists continue to run reports. So the basic idea is that um, the big problem I think for law firms right now is that they aren't collecting anywhere near enough data to get at um, to get at what would be the essentials for performance within a law firm. Um, because they, law firms don't have the same open source background that coders have, and so that makes a big difference. Um, and that's why we think you would need to be an external um, external source that could do it across all law, fir law firms to kind of build that data set. The only thing is it would have to be like, you know, like we would have added, added challenges in terms of like client confidentiality and stuff would have to be kind of non-content specific when we're looking at like research strategies or, you know, emailing practices or meetings. Um, but one final thing is that you, so one point is that the Stone Age um, built the modern age, so a little 2001 reference, um, and therefore in the same way that if you can use intuitionals, you can have a system that builds on itself over time. Thank you, but given the time, I suggest we save our questions for after where right. anybody wants to sit around and ask questions, maybe we'll do that for everybody else. Thank you. We'll see you next week. I just want, just one point quickly. So I've had this really cool uh, project because it really goes to the heart of what's kind of holding up innovation in, in uh, the legal system, which is the billable hour. Right? And even if firms go to flat fees, all the advancements within the firms is still based on billable hours. So I think it's a very creative project to try to come up with an alternative way to measure people's effectiveness in firms and create a different system for people to advance. So that's the basic premise of, yeah. of this effort. And I think it's really cool because it's trying to put the leverage for like, the key problem is in sort of hurdles to innovation in the legal profession. So thank you.